Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to BioStrategy Partners' third Practical Knowledge Series seminar of the 2021 season. Today, we're going to explore customer discovery, understanding who will use and pay for your invention. We have a great panel for you today. Um, and a word about BioStrategy Partners. Um, we are a, a, a 501c3 nonprofit consortium of academic medical centers and research institutes. And the idea is to speed new ideas to market, and we focus on the life sciences. We have two core programs, one of which is the Practical Knowledge Series um, that you're learning more about today. And thank you again for joining us. The other is the what we call our Germinator program, which is a, a way to understand if there is a good match between our industry partners and our academic uh, research partners. And um, if you'd like to learn more about those, you can find us at biostrategypartners.org. So today, as I mentioned, we have a, a great set of panelists, um, real experts in the field of customer discovery. Your moderator today will be Erica Swift, um, and our panelists today are Julie Collins and Christina Pelican. As always, we want to thank our sponsors. They're what make this program possible and at no cost to you, to our audience. So thank you always to MBM Associates, to Cesar Raviz, and to University Place Associates. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Erica. Thank you, Michelle. All right, before we dive into our topic today, let's do some introductions. Um, Julie, do you want to get us started? Sure. Hello, everybody. My name is Julie Collins. I am a faculty instructor for the NSF i program. In my previous background, I um, had an academic career working at the VA Medical Center and Emory University studying molecular genetics. Um, none of which was really easily translatable into any sort of commercial product. Um, I spent a, ne a next part of my career working with entrepreneurs at the Advanced Technology Development Center at Georgia Tech, working with both university-based entrepreneurs as well as community-based entrepreneurs applying for non-dilutive funding and eventually ran our statewide SBIR assistance program. And that was about the same time that uh, Georgia Tech got that first node grant um, for the i program. And so I have been um, teaching i since about 2012, um, being a part of those sort of i courses and um, loved it so much, watched what all the companies that I was advising to get non-dilutive funding were doing wrong and how to better educate them to do it right. Um, and so I'm just a, I'm a real convert to the program and just love being an instructor. So at this point in time, I've, I've led node activities and done things at Georgia Tech, but at this point in time, I full-time um, teach some sort of lean startup type program for a whole wide variety of audiences. Great, thank you. Christina, how about you? Yeah. Hi, I'm Christina Pellican. I'm currently Vice President of Business Development at Lignolix, which is a specialty chemical startup that spun out of the University of Delaware, where I worked uh, full time up until last year. Um, I've been helping the team for a few years. We've now raised nearly half a million and we're about uh, at the point where we're going to be selling soon. So some really interesting stuff there. I'm now you know, living what I teach and doing customer discovery very actively. I actually have an interview with a customer right after this panel. So I'm really, uh, you know, doing the entrepreneurship thing. It's been it's been a fun ride for the past few months that I've been with them. Um, aside from that, I'm also doing a lot of part-time work still. I work part-time as an expert at the National Science Foundation, primarily reviewing the SBIR STTR submissions, the project pitches that come in. Um, and I do that for the portfolio of chemical tech, energy tech, biotech, nanotech, distributed ledger, I'm probably forgetting one, but uh, a lot of different technical areas. So it's really, it's a fun part-time job to have to be reviewing, you know, 40 or so pitches every week coming in that are really deeply technical and seeing kind of what these uh, PIs have um, are aiming to do. I've also been an SBIR STTR reviewer for seven or eight years now, as well as a, a national i instructor for the same amount of time. Um, and just like Julie, we, we teach deep tech entrepreneurs, um, mostly at universities, but uh, I've also taught in a number of different countries, most recently in Canada. It was virtual, but the uh, Canada Lab to Market program last fall. And um, before kind of leaving the, um, so this past year I've been traveling and I was supposed to be traveling South America, but that didn't work out because of the pandemic. Before that, I was um, director of commercialization at the University of Delaware's Entrepreneurship Center. And there I ran a $2 million fund uh, for proof of concept grants, um, supported about 25 startups in the um, 
three or four years I was there, they went on to raise, so the, I deployed about 1.3 million, they went on to raise 12 million in funding, um, you know, so some really good returns there. Uh, it wasn't equity investment, so we didn't get returns, but some great economic impact. Um, and then before that, I was working at the New York City node, um, i -Corp node, as the executive manager when that first started back in 2013. Um, so had a really great ride in the entrepreneurship space. Before I started doing this kind of stuff, I was a researcher at a biotech startup. Um, we had some good successes, patented a venture from that, got uh, published in the High Impact Journal. We presented at a Gordon conference, some, you know, great, like, you know, uh, research credentials, but it didn't feel like enough. So that's why I kind of went into helping other scientists and engineers make an impact with their with their research. So that's what I've been up to the past decade or so and happy to be here with you today. Oh, thank you so much, Christine. We are so excited to have both of you here with your tremendous background and expertise. Um, I'm super excited about this panel. For those in the audience who don't know me, I'm Erica Swift, the Associate Director of the Center for Medical Innovation at Penn State College of Medicine. I joined Penn State in 2015. Prior to that, I have a little over 20 years experience in, uh, in industry working in everything from medical devices to consumer goods to dental products. I actually owned my own um, company for eight years and joined Penn, the Penn State team in 2015. And shortly thereafter, we got our first award and were the first of nine sites to do a regional short course for the i at NIH. So yes, we're very excited about this program. We've seen the tremendous impact that customer discovery and i has had at Penn State. So I'm really excited to share all of that with you today. All right, so let's let's start this this topic. Um, you know, customer discovery is a term that has integrated into the language of the startup world. The methodology has even entered into academia. You know, as I was just sharing, you know, we got our first award back in 2016. So while customer discovery has proven to be incredibly invaluable for entrepreneurs and innovative researchers, it's actually part of a system from the Lean Startup created by Steve Blank. So I thought before we dive into customer discovery, I want to take us a moment to kind of go back. So that lean startup and the genesis of the National Science Foundation, how they created the Innovation Core or i -Corps program, which incorporates customer discovery. So Christine, can you just share with the audience some history about why the NSF launched the i -Corps program? Sure, yeah, it was actually started by some SBR, STTR program directors. They were seeing um, a really small percent of their academic researchers, their, you know, basic research grantees, then converting into submitting SBIR, STTR proposals. So they wanted to increase that number and, and have the the kind of the loop that they're looking for. So if you think about it from, the, you know, the taxpayer cycle, you know, these basic R&D grants are funded by taxpayer dollars, then hopefully some of those R&D projects then, you know, transition into the marketplace and become companies that then, you know, have to pay taxes and then that funds the loop back again. And they were seeing a disconnect between, you know, again, the R&D funded researchers and the uh, the folks that are applying for SBR, STTR. So um, Errol Arkelik is the, the guy that really kind of spearheaded this back in 2011. Um, he, the story is, he called up Steve Blank, who was teaching a course at Stanford, uh, I believe it was Stanford, Julie, you can correct me on this one, but um, he was blogging about it. And uh, Errol read the blog and said, we need to do something like this. And he asked Steve, can you teach this for our, um, you know, for our uh, academic uh, PIs so that they can do better at thinking about applying for SBR, STTR? And he said, I can teach it, but I'm, you need to, you know, you need this to scale. So they very quickly started to create a network. Um, and there's another guy named Don Millard, electrical engineer. So he came up with the idea of nodes, which is what we call the centers now of these, um, you know, the academic groups of, of you know, these universities that are grouped together to teach the, the program. So we have the nodes and then we have these sites um, and all together they come up, they create the i -Corps network. Um, and so that's kind of how it got started was to, you know, to really get stronger SBIR and STTR proposals coming in. And that actually has proven to be true. Um, it is not because you've gone through i -Corps that, you, you know, you don't have like some stamp on your proposal that says we've been through i -Corps. please, you know, we deserve more funding than someone who hasn't. Um, but it, it is the concepts that you learn and the way that you think about the market and really the connections that you build by way of going through i -Corps help strengthen your SBR, STTR proposal 
And there's been a, um, I, we can't officially say the numbers, and I don't know if it's accurate anymore, but there's been a, a large increase in the likelihood of receiving an SBIR grant um, if you have gone through i -Corps. So we really encourage teams to go through i for that reason, you know, to help you continue to commercialize through federal research dollars. Um, and then back in 2018, um, Obama signed it into law, you know, Congress, et cetera, and uh, that expanded to eight federal agencies. So it's no longer just an NSF program, but it is offered by many, including NIH, where Julie teaches at. That's like the really quick uh, story. There's plenty of uh, different aspects of that story we could share, but um, that's kind of how it got started and, and very quickly how it grew. All right. Well, thank you, Christina. Now, Julie, you're a certified NSF i -Corps instructor. So how has implementing the i -Corps methodology influenced the NSF and the NIH community of researchers? Like, what have you seen? So great question. I think it's really interesting to kind of go back to what Christina was just talking about in terms of when this started, you know, back in sort of that mid-2000 period and look at the university landscape of entrepreneurship that was happening at the time and specifically at Georgia Tech. You know, we had a community of entrepreneurs, we had accelerator programs, but I will say from an engineering department perspective, there wasn't this sort of um, taking technical engineers and making them think about the market from a customer user adoption standpoint, which is what the Lean Startup is good at. And if I, if I fast forward um, 10 years later, a decade later, and look at the university landscape and the number of programs that have embraced educating both faculty members as well as graduate students on this idea of thinking about use and adoption of products, even if it's something that's you know 10 years down in the horizon before you start um, investing in research has really sort of changed the entire landscape of the types of grants that people are proposing for. Um, you know, primarily it started with the NSF, but we're seeing it throughout the NIH as well. Um, and just the way that graduate students and faculty members are thinking about the, the research to truly be translatable, which is what NCATS is so, has been so good at um, for so many years. Um, so it's, it's, it's a tremendous, it's a great question to ask, and it's really something that everybody should be proud of in terms of the way a, a program that our tax dollars are supporting. The i program is really changing not just the commercial landscape, but the landscape of academic research. Oh, thank you, Julie. You know, I know at Penn State, we've seen that as well. Um, so as I mentioned in 2016, we were one of the nine sites throughout the country that received the NIH award to actually do a pilot program of a regional short course. And, you know, with our researchers, we have a lot of innovative researchers who thinking that they want to take their technologies forward into a startup, only to realize they don't. They like their lab. They want to stay in their lab. But the i -Corps methodology has been a game changer even in their grant submission and how they think about their research and making it translatable to society. Um, so yeah, we've seen some really great things since 2016 as well. All right, so a vital component to i -Corps is training is this translational research to commercialization applications. And, you know, and that's really that customer discovery process. So let's take some time to really unpack and explore what customer discovery is. Um, Julie, can you start us off? Just what is customer discovery? Sure, just on the basic level, it's talking to the people who would use and adopt your product or your service and understanding what they do today and what are their limitations and really getting sort of that boots on the ground perspective um, from a market perspective. And we all sort of, especially as technologists and those who are in science, we understand sort of the utility of what we're doing and how we could improve somebody's actual, like, you know, that one particular assay or test, but we don't really think about how that assay or test is used um, at the at the business level in terms of how it's moving the products and services forward and what are the other assays and services they've tried and what are the limitations to purchasing. There's just so much to unpack there to actually make something translatable from the lab to the marketplace. And so at a base level, customer discovery is interacting with your customers, but trying to remove your bias and ask some questions from a really broad, open-ended standpoint. Christina, we'll turn the floor over to you as far as the customer discovery and what you've experienced with your teams. Sure. Uh, yeah. And I think, you know, Julie covered it really well. I, the only thing I could probably add on is um, when we think about it, 
a customer, a lot of times people who are new to the i -Corps methodology just think about the user. And that's not the case here, especially in life sciences. There's so many um, kinds of customers. So you can use the word stakeholder if you'd rather, um, you know, to, to think about the type of person we're thinking about. So when we talk about customer, we define it as an end user, a payer, um, decision maker, an influencer, a recommender, and even a saboteur. And within the, um, you know, within the life sciences vertical, there's also the nuance of the end user, which is usually like a patient, and then the person who's going to be actually using it, which might be, you know, the physician. And that person may or may not also be the decision maker. That could be something like the, you know, value committee or the purchasing committee within the hospital. Um, so there's all these different kinds of stakeholders that we think about, and you have to uh, meet with all of them. Ideally, nowadays that we're virtual on some kind of video chat, so you can actually um, see their reaction and talk to them face to face as best we can now um, and really ask them questions to help de-risk the hypotheses that you have about your business model. So you think that it might be valuable, um, you know, to a certain degree to this kind of person um, and in this kind of use case. But what you need to figure out is what are the workflows, the jobs to be done is the word we use. What are the jobs to be done for these customers and what unmet needs do they have? And by the way, I've learned this past week that that's not a good question to ask in customer discovery. I asked that question and a person that I was interviewing had previously given me a really great unmet need, but they didn't think about it that way. So asking the question, what are your unmet needs? falls flat, at least in, in, um, in the interviews I've done lately. So you have to be really specific about how you phrase the questions. It's not just tell me about your pain points. Tell me about your challenges. It is you know, much more nuanced than that. And it's it's a great way to get to know people and really hear from their perspective on what uh, what struggles they have or what they would be delighted by that they don't have already. All right, thank you. Now, Christina, I read an interview that you did a couple of years ago, so I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit, but I thought you had a really nice response as far as what customer discovery is not, which I think is really helpful when you're really trying to understand a concept, you know, what it is, but what it's not. Can you share, you know, especially since we have quite a few researchers on the call today, you know, just so they fully understand what, this process, what is it not? Yeah, so there's a couple of things um, that I can share, and I'm sure Julie has seen lots of the same and maybe some different ones, but um, the biggest thing that we see is people pitching their technology in some shape or form. They don't even view it as pitching it when they go into these interviews. And if you ask them, did you pitch or did you sell, they say no. But then when you ask them what questions did you ask, it's very obvious that they were. So the, the most important thing is not to talk about your technology. When I'm introducing Lignolix to potential interviewees, I've actually been so vague that people are like, well, can you tell me a little bit more so I even know from the right person that you need to talk to? And I'm like, I don't, I don't want to. Just trust me. You are the right person. You are super experienced in this. I want to talk to you. I want to learn about you. And it's not, let me tell you about my cool new you know, process that I have or um, you know, this new device that I've come up with. And, and you really should not mention that as best as you can in an interview. If at the end of an interview, and ideally not even the first interview, if you have two or three interviews with someone, you know, at the end of that maybe third interview, you can start to share with that person what you're working on, but only at a really high level because, and this is kind of how I describe it to entrepreneurs, give yourself the space and time and freedom to pivot as needed. You might not end up creating something entirely different, but the way that you think about it and phrase it might change. And that's really important to, to give yourself the, the time to explore that. So if you tell someone, this is what we're working on, and then in two weeks time, you do a few more interviews and you figure out, actually, no, it, it should be phrased this other way. And then you go back to this person that you know you value and you go and tell them, I know it's only been two weeks, but we've changed some things. Let me tell you why. Your cred credibility goes down a little bit. So if nothing else, it's really nice for you to, to just give yourself some freedom there to explore. Um, and then obviously the most, you know, um, the most common issue that will come up if you talk about your technologies, you're going to bias the interviewee and you're only going to hear from them what they think you want to hear. Um, so that's the biggest thing that I've seen and what not to do. Um, the other thing that isn't really part of the interview process or the interview itself, but it's um, something I just saw with some teaching an I-Corps or site course at the university, or I'm not teaching it anymore. I used to. Uh, I'm now mentoring in the program. Um, and the teams presented this past week and some of them did really well on their interview count and some of them had one or two interviews in the past two weeks and you know the excuses that we get are always the same well this uh market is really niche there's not a lot of my customers here you know if i talk to everyone in the ecosystem it would only be five people um you know they're really hard to get a hold of these are you know uh 
gastroenterologists that are super busy and et cetera, et cetera. I don't care. I mean, if, you, if you're going to be selling to them, you need to be talking to them. So the easiest thing you can do is, um, is do an interview with them. It's even harder to do a sale. So if you can't even get an interview with someone, what does that mean about you, your, you know, your scrappiness, your level of commitment to this? And, and that's something that I really push teams to do. Like with Lignolix, um, obviously we're sending LinkedIn and email, LinkedIn messages and emails, but I'm also on Clubhouse now. I'm on Twitter all the time. I'm on Instagram. I'm, um, you know, finding people through other connections. Um, there's so many different, um, there's a, a, a formula uh, school that people graduated from and they have all their list of graduates. So now I'm just like spamming all these people. I mean, there's a ton of different things I'm trying to do to get a hold of people. It can't just be, you know, well, I sent out five emails and I didn't get any interviews. That's not acceptable. So I'll pause it there. And if uh, Julie has anything to add, I'd love to hear it. Well, and this is for both of you. We actually just had a couple of questions come into the chat. Exactly what you're talking about is how do you find your customer? Who should you target? And they did a follow on, especially in the B2C or the business to consumer space. That's so a great Julie, question. You take sure, sure. That's a great question. And and I want to add on before we kind of move into that, I just want to add one thing. You asked the question about what it, what is customer's discovery not? Customer discovery is not the place for you to just validate everything that you think you should know. Customer discovery is a place for you to find the things that you don't know. OK, so I'm just going to kind of start there. So if I'm thinking about who my customer is, I'm going to sort of start with what I think my archetype might be. So um, some of you may have an assay or a therapeutic, a device, et cetera. There's somebody who's going to physically use that thing. Starting with the end user is a really great place to start. And then you want to build out your ecosystem around that in terms of the people who are setting up and taking down the surgical suite or the people that are involved in interpreting the assays results, et cetera. Um, so you really want to start with the people who are going to put their hands on your technology. And then you want to build out around that and think about the people that are involved in that use and adoption, the takedown, the teardown, as well as the disposal of that entire workflow where your technology sits. Now, for somebody who was talking about in the B2C segment, I will tell you that um, business to consumer with customer discovery is really difficult. And one of the things that we encourage, at least I do when I'm teaching um, i -Core from a with a team that's got sort of a B2C focus, is to think about who are the people who are really gonna recommend your product. So for instance, if you have some sort of um, test that might be recommend by, recommended by a physical therapist, but you're hoping that the, the end consumer is the person who's gonna purchase it, to really investigate the ecosystem around that's really going to drive adoption. Unless you're really truly in a B2C play like an app or something like that, there's some other tools that you can use. But from a customer discovery perspective, you can talk to a zillion consumers. And we all know, we all lie, I lie. We, we're the worst, I mean, for those of you who are physicians on the line, we are the worst at, um, at self-diagnosing and remembering what we did and self-reporting, that's the word. Self-reporting is awful among consumers. So you really have to be careful about that and, and do some of your investigation from a standpoint of where are consumers gonna hear about your technology and kind of focus your customer discovery there. That's fantastic, Julie. So before we move on from this, you also had an example of a research team that was trying to attract a strategic partner and, you know, to further and develop, commercialize their technology. Um, but they were having some, they weren't being successful until customer discovery. Can you just share that, that story with the audience and how customer discovery became a game changer for them? Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, this is a quite a tremendous company um, creating a therapeutic, a non-opioid um, based pain management therapy um, that before they came into the NIH i -Corps course had already had some conversations with some strategics that they, you know, I mean, you're, if you're in pain management, you kind of have an idea of what that target customer segment is. Um, you know, you're really focused on sort of that clinical trial design, et cetera. But they really hadn't gotten into the nitty gritty of the delivery. Is this oral? Is this IV? What's the target patient population? Who is the physician that's going to be the ones that are really going to prescribe this on day one? Just like kind of that whole package of data that then influences what those clinical trials are. 
And as they went through customer discovery, because they spoke to over 100 people in the ecosystem, the data package that they were able to come away with, the quotes that they were able to amass, really put them in the driver's seat when they sat down with that strategic for the second time. So the first time it was much more of a science talk, um, knowing about what the technology can do, knowing that this is a really hot space and that the strategic is in that space as well. The second conversation, sort of the tables were turned. We know the people that are writing the scripts. We know what this formulation has to look like. We know what the adoption curve is gonna look like based on our bulk of interviews, which just, you know, being on the other side of the table, the strategic is like, oh, you really know what you're talking about. And they ended i with a really large contract signed. So there's a lot of validity in actually having customer quotes, customer interviews um, in mass and being able to talk, to talk about them from that position. Oh, a fantastic, fantastic example. Now, Christina, I knew you had an example about a hydrogel dressing company where they didn't do customer discovery. And can you share a little bit about that experience? Yeah. So the team, as always, they were researchers uh, at a university, and I think this boiled down to more, um, more so that they didn't want to be entrepreneurs. They wanted to do the commercialization stuff, but they didn't really commit to it. And what they ended up doing, so they had a, a hydrogel wound dressing that could have been used for um, for trauma wounds, for diabetes patients, um, and, and or for uh, drug delivery. Um, and each of these they were looking at had three different types of clinical trials that they would have to do. And they were looking at the price point of doing these trials. And it was I don't remember uh, in the total, but just to set up each one was something like 50,000. Um, and so it was gonna be a lot of their money that they had. It, they had a very limited budget already for this and um, they weren't sure which one to pursue. And I said, well, let's do some customer discovery. And they kind of um, kicked the can down the road and kind of just uh, asked some of their advisors what they think they should do and never ended up doing customer discovery. And they found that they ran out of money before they ever ended up figuring out which, which trial to go for. So that was one example of, you know, if they had just given two months of their time to doing this and to exploring where is the best first market for us, what we call a beachhead market. Um, and so, again, that a beachhead market is your best first market to pursue. It is not the one that's necessarily going to be the largest. Um, it might not be super, uh, you know, a red ocean or a blue ocean. It doesn't. There are different parameters that we look for when we think about the, the beachhead market. But. The, be, the way that I think about it is highest potential to lowest, along with lowest challenge to enter that market. So um, that's really all they needed to figure out. And again, they could have gone through the i program, spent two months doing that. Um, they didn't, and they ran out of cash and, and are have no longer have that company, even though it wasn't really truly a company, in my opinion. Yeah. There's a lot of, so Erica, if you don't mind, I'll just sort of like, uh, from, from the perspective of, I know many of you may have technologies, you're probably familiar with the SBI or STTR program, which we're gonna talk about later. But um, that's also the challenge with going after research grants and, and thinking about what the federal programs are proposing that you write for as evidence of market need, instead of getting it from the customer focus and, and chasing the grants. And so similar comments to what Christina said with this one particular opportunity, I can't tell you how many companies, you know, we won them, you know, bolstering up their grants and helping them with other non-dilutive funding options, millions of dollars in seed funding that all went to technology development in the wrong spot. Um, and they went to go launch the launch the product and there just was no traction. So the value of customer discovery will help you to do the early product development in the right space. Um, thank you for those examples. I actually, I love those examples because <clears throat> they speak directly to how the i program and customer discovery in one instance can take a stalled research innovation and really give it the focus it needs to understand that they're solving that meaningful problem. Um, you know, and that's that as as you said, is investable and can ultimately improve patient care. You know, so having a process such as customer discovery is so important, I think, for researchers, you know, and early stage companies to really find that focus. I would like to take some time to discuss the other benefits of customer discovery process to researchers, innovators, and even entrepreneurs. Um, you know, but I we actually got some questions from the audience upon registration. 
So the one question that came in was, who is the ideal customer? And Christina, you mentioned beachhead customer. So how about we start with you and we expanding on that ideal customer, that beachhead customer? Sure, and there's no way to know that unless you know it, right? So you kind of have to find that person and it, it usually almost always happens by happenstance. And um, and then you'll realize that that is your early evangelist, uh, that one person in particular. And then in general, the beachhead is the the opportunity that represents, you know, where that one person might, you know, that market that that person exists in. Um, and I don't know who said the quote, but um, luck is when opportunity. Uh, oh gosh, I'm so bad at quotes. But it's when opportunity meets preparation. Is that right, Julie? Is that is that okay? <laughs> I, I usually butcher right. those, but um, <laughs> yeah, so something like that. I mean, it, it's getting lucky, but it's also being so prepared and doing the work um, that leads up to getting that luck. And so that's kind of what we, why we ask and really demand that teams do 100 interviews in this eight week program that we run. Um, you know, you have to, it's almost always like the 86th interviewee that becomes the, the best one that you've ever had, right? The person that gives you so many incredible insights. Um, it's never the 30th, it's never the 40th, and it's very, very rarely the, you know, in the 60s or 70s. Um, and that's because the first 30 or so, you're figuring out how to even ask the right questions, how to have a good conversation rather than, you know, a QA and a or, you know, the other worst case scenarios, you talk about your technology too much, right? So the first 30 are basically a wash. Um, and one of the, the cohorts that I ran probably two years ago now, uh, a woman who was the EL of the team, the entrepreneur lead of the team, she came up to the um, the front and she was like, I know the COO of Siemens. Can I go interview him this week? She said, no, please don't, <laughs> don't do that. It'll be a wasted interview. I mean, that's fantastic that you know that person, but these first few interviews, you don't know what to ask and what you're doing and you know how to react. Um, so save that for a little bit down the road. Um, and so I think it's really important to, to put in the work, but also to be, to just realize that it's going to just be luck that you find the right person that's going to help you uh, to move things forward um, and to to advocate for you within their company to uh, if it is a b2b play um, you know to to have you as the as the supplier or or you know the person selling to them right whatever that might look like um, so that's kind of the the early evangelist concept and then the beachhead market concept is um, again your best first application and there's a great set of worksheets that uh, I think Julie now uses as well, but we, we've kind of started to use here and there within these programs. Um, it's called the Where to Play worksheet. So you can just Google Where to Play. You can download their free PDFs. I don't make any commission off this. I just enjoy using them. Um, and there's three consecutive worksheets that you can use to help you think through, um, yeah, thanks Julie, where, uh, where to start. Um, and so the first exercise is just a, a brainstorming data dump. Where are all the potential applications that this technology could be used for? And let's just put them all in stickies and throw them down. No right or wrong answer. Just put everything in the foreseeable future down in this bucket. And then you start to categorize it by potential and challenge. So, you know, how uh, difficult would it be for the customer to adopt? How strong of an unmet need is there in this application? Um, you know, how many competitors are there already? What kind of, uh, you know, product development are you going to have to do? Is it a lot or a little to get into, uh, to have the product ready for this specific market? And all these kinds of, kinds of questions. And then you can categorize each of these applications that you put in the first bucket in a, in a, a matrix on um, challenge and potential. And then finally, you do the dark board, which is, you know, which one's the best first, and then which is the growth opportunity, and then which is more of a long term uh application so that i think really nicely puts down to paper some of the concepts that we've been teaching but i will say especially for that second exercise it's just guesses until you um really do the customer discovery and i think customer discovery really helps to reinforce all of those questions around the potential and the challenge so that's that's early evangelists and beachhead at a high level and, and julie teaches this really well so i'm curious what your thoughts are on it so just, I mean, the only thing I would add, I mean, I think that's a huge, that's a really great overview by Christina. I, just to kind of put this in some sort of like real tactical points, what you're looking for is somebody, you have a, a, an idea of a technical solution. And so what we say is that the person who's going to use that has some sort of job that is specific to using that solution. And you're looking for somebody who the, the use of that solution in their job 
is something that is of high priority to them. Um, and so I could use the example that there's a lot of different cardiovascular surgeons that use different tools in their um, surgeries, different shunts, et cetera. Based on the patient populations that they see, the um, institutions that they work for, um, whether they're salaried or not, there's different reasons why a particular part of the surgery or a particular issue would be top of mind for them. You're looking for those people where the innovation that you're proposing really hits a top of mind priority, a top of mind job for those people and the solutions that they have access to. So based on the clinic or the circumstance or the context, they don't have access to a solution that is really satisfying those needs. And it's, it's that underserved space. It's where those two things come together um, that you're looking for those people, and this is the way we describe it, is that you're looking for people who are willing to take a risk. That pain point is so severe and the solutions that they have access to are so insufficient that they're willing to take a risk on a startup's product that might not be perfect on day one. Um, there might be some issues around the way the company is formed, but they're so interested in being your first adopters that they're going to take a risk on you. And that's really what you're looking for. And that's awesome. For Julie, you know, the one thing that always struck me when I've sat through two of your courses, which are fantastic, um, <laughs> the image that you bring up that kind of looks like a scatter plot, I don't know how else to describe yeah. it, but you really then, as you start to stare at it, you start to see the shapes in the image and you talk about pattern recognition. Can you just share that in the interview process and, you know, just share a little bit about that pattern recognition through interviews. Absolutely. I think the hardest part and what Christina was hitting on with um, performing a good customer interview is that there's so much complexity to understanding who are those people that really have a pain point that you're addressing that are truly not satisfied with the solutions that they have. And so when you first go out and have customer interviews, um, it's like you have um, a one of those I was going to say dot matrix, but um, pointillism, if anybody's into art, where you take little tiny dots to make the picture. It's like you're zoomed into a pointillism picture and all you can see are the blue, red and green dots and you're starting to get some information, but probably it's high level. And I'm going to guess you're probably not learning a whole ton that you didn't know initially. And the benefit of working with a good coach, and this is what Christina and I are both passionate about, is a good coach is going to sit you, sit you down and help you to unpack the places where you might have missed something or an opportunity to dig further. And so then when you have those refined places where you are conducting those interviews and gaining better insights, it's like you're zooming out of a picture that's done with pointillism or a dot matrix, and you're starting to see the clarity of, oh, this is actually a landscape or this is actually a still life, right? And, and really what you're getting is a fuller picture of where who that person is, what the customer archetype is, where they sit, the context in which they work. And then hopefully what you're getting is an idea of, oh, now how would I make a business model that actually is profitable in this space? How would I think about charging for this and gaining revenue and what would it look like? And that's the fun part. Once you have a better picture of what the customer is, then you can start to think about what is business model design to service those particular customers. And so then you're kind of back and, and messing with the painting and putting the different pieces together and saying, this is what this is gonna look like and I'm excited about it. Oh, that's awesome. So one statement that you, you both have mentioned previously is bias. So can we just take a moment to talk about bias and how that influences interviews, either what you're saying or what you're hearing and what should our audience be watching out for? So either Julia or Julie or Christina, whoever wants to take it first. I think we could both come up with a zillion examples of, oh, the bias. Christina, I'll pop in with just a couple and then I'll let you sort of fill it out. Um, I'm going to start with the basic one, which is you all have technical bias. Um, that either comes from your degree or that comes from the fact that you use products and services today. So you have the, those biases. Um, and maybe you've spent the last 10 years um, working on research in a particular arena. So you have bias there. Christina, what else would you add to that list? Yeah, no, that's a good, the technical one is always first and foremost. Um, and so just to, you know, quick example on that um, or thing to look out for really is don't meet with other researchers because it's basically interviewing a mirror. 
Um, you're not really going to learn any from, anything from someone who's just like you. Um, so try to get away from those kind of interviews as quickly as possible. Um, the other kind of bias that I've seen is about the kind of uh, market that a team might want to pursue. And I think this is an important one because it matters where you spend the next five, 10, even more if it ends up being a longer term uh, company than of your how many of those years of your life you're going to spend in this market. Um, and one of the companies that I was mentoring at um, University of Delaware, he was focused on it's strict robotics and he was focused on um, his robot can do sensing and characterization, right? So he was focused on SWAT teams at first. Well, not at first, but eventually that's where he landed. There was a lot of pivoting that happened. And while he was going through i that was his focus. And so he got to talk to a lot of people in law enforcement, on SWAT teams, um, you know, at the DOD, some really interesting people. And that's kind of what he enjoyed. He's um, a mechanical engineer. He really liked the, uh, you know, the ethos that these people had, and they really loved to geek out with him and, and play with the robot with him. It was kind of like, um, you know, a fun experience for him. What ended up happening was he realized that that, that market was not a good best first one. It took him a while to figure that out um, because of the bias, but finally he let go of it. Um, the reason it wasn't a good first one to enter was because either the SWAT teams were over they had plenty of funding. They didn't need this cheap, more or less disposable robot at a you know a $2,000 price point. They had the $50,000 robot. You see these ones that are going in to sniff out bombs, right? There's these huge, well-constructed, super, you know, uh, um, all these features, right? This is a very complex, expensive robot. The SWAT teams had them. They didn't need any more. And then the police departments didn't have them, but they didn't have the budget for it either. So they thought it was cool, and they loved to, to play with the robot with him and you know, and, and uh, they were always happy to do customer discovery with him, but he, after a year, maybe a year and a half, never ended up getting a sale. Um, and, it, and so he's finally, he realized he had to pivot. So he looked at other places that a robot for characterization could be used for. And he pivoted into agriculture. And I remember the first meeting I had with him after he did a, a bulk of interviews in ag and realized that this is a real unmet need. People need to understand what their yields, their crop are. And, and now where he's focused on is, um, treating for a specific uh, set of, um, of fungus and, and pests really um, in strawberry fields. This is a really big issue. It's a very expensive issue. The agricultural, these farmers really care about it. They are willing to spend money. Right now they have to hire teams of people in full suits to come in and do, you know, use their UV, uh, you know, systems to um, manually treat the, uh, the plants. And so this automated robot going down the rows of strawberries would be fantastic. But after the first few interviews, he came and sat in my office and was telling me about these, telling me about these strawberry growers. And I just I felt like the emotion wasn't there uh, as much as it was when he was telling me about the SWAT interviews. And I said, Adam, let's let's talk about this. Are you interested in spending the next 10 years of your life working for farmers, essentially? I mean, your customers are you know who you're going to be working for. So you're going to be interacting with farmers. Is that what you want to do? And he leaned back and I mean, he almost cried. And he was like, listen, this is a big thing for me. I had to let go of something that you know, that I really was passionate about and loved and spent years of my life. And, and it was hard to let go of that. But I really just want to solve these problems. And I'm really excited to actually help someone who's willing to talk to me and, and give me money. Right. So um, he's been spending the past year or so on, on this focus area. And it's been uh, a really I mean, he's been scaling on the testing side. Now we're pushing him to actually go get money from these people. They have it and they're willing to pay. He's just needs to transition into that new kind of entrepreneur. But that's one example of you know bias, and the example I could share with like Nolix is you know these guys are chemical engineers, the co-founders, um, and they were focused on first materials like adhesives, and then they uh, pivoted to flavors and fragrances, and now we're in the cosmetic space, which is a really big um, space, and I mean money-wise, like there's a lot of money to be made, and especially when it comes to clean beauty, you know, natural alternatives for ingredients. But there, we've had a couple conversations about you know these are chemical engineer guys, you know the having uh, cosmetic companies as their customers is a little bit uncomfortable for them. So, you know, it, it's kind of a, a bias against it, but not for any good reason. It's just kind of like, do we want to spend our life doing this, you know, the next five, 10 years doing, um, you know, working in this application area. So I think that's a real question to ask yourself if, you know, if, um, if you do pivot into an area that again, life science isn't so much um, at risk for this, but there is some variation in who your customers could be. So, Anyways, I think that's one of the biases that I've seen that are, it's really interesting to see what, how entrepreneurs react to these kinds of things. Erica, if you don't mind, there's a question in the chat that, do, do you do you want me to answer those now or do you want us to wait? No, go, go right ahead. 
There's a Tina brought up a good question in chat saying many researchers sometimes have a hard time keeping customer discovery qualitative um, and searching for overall patterns versus quantifying the data as absolute. And so just as we're talking about what Christina was saying in terms of being passionate about where you are and, and doing customer discovery interviews, I was also going to add that you need to be careful about the bias of how big the market size is and how big the opportunity is, whether or not you're oversizing it or undersizing it. Um, and part of that problem, and uh, what I was going to say to that bias is the best way to do that is to take really good track notes of the people that you're talking to and making sure that you're really tracking standard data. Um, understanding sort of who the people are and where they sit and how much buying power they have and the solutions they're using and the comparative analysis of the solutions they're using versus your solution. So just to sort of kind of tie those two things together, having that sort of, there's lots of bias that you guys all have in terms of the opportunity size, the technical space, whether or not you're gonna be passionate about being in that space. So just sort of, I always counsel my teams to take those biases and put them on the wall, sit down today, write them on a sticky note, put them on the wall and hold yourself accountable. But then as you're sizing, as you're taking all those notes and really doing good customer discovery, just to Tina's point, make sure that you're really capturing really detailed notes um, so that you can compare your interviews one to another and you're not just sort of um, being overly qualitative um, and maybe taking one interview and saying, well, somebody, this person said it, so this market must be great. Uh, Just to add on, I think another point too, is to make sure that you're having regular meetings with your team to process the data at, at the right interval. So at Lignolix, because we're heavy into customer discovery right now, we're meeting at least for one hour every week. We have a, a one hour block schedule, but we're always meeting in between that. So just constantly go back with your team realize the insights that you've had from the last week of interviews and draw some patterns from that change your questions that you're asking based on what you're learning and move forward from there so just make sure that you're constantly checking in with your team and hopefully you have a team if not then find a good mentor or coach and you know because you need someone who's going to give you some good unbiased uh, feedback those are fantastic points i i do want to pull out two words that you you said just so our audience can understand them fully you, you mentioned insights and pivots do you, either one of you want to take a moment and just briefly explain what an insight and what is pivoting? Sure, I'll start with insights. Um, so you're going to, if when you perform customer discovery, you're going to receive, there's a conversation that happens and people are going to say things. And so the first insight is to be able to unpack what they told you um, in terms of their use and adoption of certain products and services and ask whether or not you really understood what their role is in the ecosystem. So what is the insight around that archetype and whether or not they're a user adopter, et cetera, of the solution? The second insight is to be able to translate that and ask the question, what does this mean to the opportunity? That's the second level of insight. So the first insight is like, who is this person? And is this somebody that's in or out of the particular opportunity and how is it helping me to understand the opportunity? And then the second level of insight is to say, what does this mean to the opportunity itself? Does this mean that I am narrowing, expanding? Is this helping me have a better understanding of what my distribution strategy might be or how I'm gonna gain revenue? It's to take it back. I mean, there's lots of different canvases that you can use. In iCore, we use the business model canvas, but it's extrapolating that to the business model canvas and saying, what is the business model prototype going to be if I were to launch a product or service into this marketplace? And I don't, Christina, you wanna tackle pivots? Yeah, sure, the one, the one liner on that is a, a substantial change to one or more aspects of your business model canvas. So if you change who your customers are, or you change your value proposition, or the distribution channel, et cetera, uh, that's a pivot. So it's a, a substantive change, not just an iteration or, the other term we use is pirouette, which is spinning around in a circle. So if you don't have the data or insights to help inform the pivot, that's just a pirouette. You're spinning around within your own you know, thought process. That's my favorite. <laughs> All right, that is fantastic. All right, you know, we have several academic researchers in our audience today. So I, I wanna take a moment too. I mean, we've really spent a, a lot of time talking about customer discovery, what it is, you know, what it's not, why it's important. Um, you know, so why don't we, can we 
give them a little bit of insight on what to expect as they jump into this customer discovery process? What should they expect? Hmm. That's a great question. And I think that's sort of, so I'm going to, I'm going to give a broad level answer and then let Christina provide some insight, especially since she's doing this full time. This is what she's doing right now. Um, but I think in terms of what you can expect, number one, if you join a program, expect to be challenged. I'm just going to say that right up front. Expect everything that you walk in with to be challenged in some degree, form or fashion and take that as a um, compliment. That's not a, that's not a negative. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, um, however, whatever your personality is, the process of engaging in customer discovery means you're going to be up against some things that challenge your assumptions about what either the market or the customer looks like. And the better open you are to being challenged, the more enjoyable the experience will be. Um, the second thing I can just guarantee is that um, depending on whether or not you've done this before, there's you're, you're going to have to be uncomfortable. There's going to be some uncomfortableness, at least maybe in that sort of um, getting the customer, getting the customer to, to start to say yes to those interviews. It might be uncomfortable to conduct the interviews. Um, there's going to be some issues there and then you're going to do this as a team so there might be some uncomfortableness in having those conversations and maybe hearing something that your teammate doesn't agree with and having those so there's just a lot of like little um, it, there it's some challenging aspects to being a part of a customer discovery process Christina what would you add to that yeah that's really good um... It's definitely uncomfortable, I'll tell you right now. I, I feel like I'm bothering so many people. I've sent out over, um, well, I've sent over uh, emails to over 100 people. I, and when I say emails, I mean reach outs that could have been LinkedIn messages, uh, et cetera. Um, but that that's just the number of people. I've <laughs> I've emailed almost each of them multiple times or LinkedIn messages them, et cetera. So I'm really becoming, like I'm not used to, to bothering people. If they don't want to talk to me, fine, I'll move on. Um, but there's some people that I know I really want to have a conversation with. So I'm, I'm like badgering them. I'm finding people who know them. So then I'm having an interview with that person, even if it's a low, uh, a low quality kind of interview, just so I can get a, you know, a referral to the other person. So, you know, in these beginning times, it is a lot of work on kind of trying to circle around to find the right person or set of people uh, to, to get a hold of. And I'll tell you, about a year ago, when I was teaching uh, to some other entrepreneurs, you know, this the I-Corps uh, approach, it was so much easier to get interviews at the beginning of the pandemic. People were really interested in helping each other out. There was this, like, everyone's a community, even across the world. Nowadays, people are just overworked. And so if you get started on it right now, I'll tell you what, it's hard. Um, people are, you know, I'm busy, you know, I'm trying to juggle work and, you know, schooling the kids and, and everything else, right? So. Um, it is difficult, and I, I've said at the beginning, it's not something that you can just send off a few emails every week and just expect that to work. You have to really be hustling day in and day out. Um, yeah, I don't know if that helps, but <laughs> it's it's not easy um, by any means. And I think you know what you should expect is to be uncomfortable, as Julie said, and to put in a ton of work, a ton of hours. Um, the other thing too is people are going to be they're going to reject you, right? There's uh, there was a woman who responded to one of my LinkedIn messages. I mean, she was she was nice enough about it, but she was like, I don't have any interest in speaking to you, more or less. <laughs> but you could have just not responded. Like, <laughs> I'm not sure why she spent the time to write that to send it to me. And uh, and another older gentleman who's been who's retired, you can imagine the kind of um, you know mentality. He said something about like, good for you, more women need to be doing this, and you need a white knight, or I don't know, something weird rant. So there's just gonna be some weird interactions that you have, um, and you just gotta kind of brace it and embrace it and, and move forward. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really about a lot of hustle, right? So you can't just uh, sit back and hope that people get back to you. It really is, you know, you have to do the outreach and, and put in the effort for it. Yeah, I will say on the positive note, I mean, we're both talking about sort of the challenges of this. The rewarding aspect of doing customer discovery is watching things fall into place um, and learning things about the market that it, even if you decide that this is not an opportunity that you want to actually commercialize, it will impact the way, I mean, I can't tell you how many researchers I've worked with who come back and say, this is fundamentally gonna change the way that I engage with my graduate students and my postdocs. 
It's going to change the way I write for grants. It's going to change the way that I collaborate with other researchers across town simply in terms of doing customer discovery. So there's a huge reward out of engaging with the market this way. Um, it's just not as easy as asking somebody to do a market report for you. Great points. Well, we're only five minutes to the top of the hour, so I, I want to leave our audience with some additional information on how they can get involved with customer discovery, some tools that are out there, some programming that's out there. Uh, you know, so if either of you could either share, you know, some like great resources that our folks can access. And Julie, then if you can comment about the NSF i -Corps and the NIH i -Corps, that would be great. I'll, I guess I'll start, Julie, so you can wrap up with the NIH one. Um, just really quick, it, the, there is some eligibility criteria when it comes to the i -Corps program. There are plenty of lean launchpad programs out there, um, but when it comes to NSF i -Corps and even NIH i -Corps, there are some eligibility criteria. So happy to talk about that more, but just take a look at the website I um, put in the chat. It's uh, VentureWorlds page. They're the, the logistics partner for the NSF i -Corps program. The first step in um, that I would recommend is going through an i -Corps site program. So if you're affiliated with a university, um, especially now that everything's virtual, you can go to an i -Corps site. And it doesn't necessarily have to be at your university. Some universities do accept other university teams. Like at UD, we brought in everyone from the uh, from the region, and that still is the case for the University of Delaware i -Corps program. Um, and then that's the first step. You get a $3,000 grant to go through i -Corps sites. You're expected to do usually around 20 customer interviews over maybe a couple of months time frame, depending on what, how the program is structured. Everyone does different. And then the i -Corps Teams program is the one that is offered by the NSF. That's the one Julie and I are certified to teach. Um, and it is a really rigorous seven-week course that comes with a $50,000 grant. Um, the one you have here, that's the, um, if you're uh, an SBAR awardee already, then you get another $20,000 to go through it again. So you can go through i -Corps sites, get 3K, i -Corps teams, get 50K, SBAR, get 256K, and then go through SBAR, i -Corps, and get another 20K. And that's kind of the, the trajectory that we like to see happen. Awesome. So um, just a little bit of color on all the programs. Um, have somebody walk you through them. There's a lot of them. Um, so knowing when to engage and how to engage. I'll just sort of promote the fact that as if you are in sort of the bio space, um, NCATS, which is the translational science part of, of the NIH, runs short courses. And these short courses do give you eligibility to participate in the NSF full course. Um, and so that's sort of, there's some cross pollination there that happens. So I would, I would recommend that you look into i -Corps and NCATS. It's a short course. Uh, Penn State runs one, uh, Buffalo, Cleveland Clinic, lots of different places run them. Um, and just as a, as a note, i -Corps is available at multiple time points within your um, career. So as an academic, you can engage in regional short courses. You can engage in the NSF i -Corps program. If you incorporate and receive some sort of SBIR programs, you can also um, receive funding and go through i -Corps as an NSF funded company and go through the SBIR program. And then the NIH's program, they only run a full for a full-fledged program for SBIR award awardees. You have to have a phase one SBIR with the NIH in order to participate in their full-length eight-week course. And it comes with a supplement. Um, so just engage with the community to figure out, with your resources to figure out where is the best place. And then there's a question in the chat about international programs. There's tons of international programs, but um, we and we teach those international programs, but you need to be located in those international regions in order to participate in those programs. Um, so the programs that we have here are, are national programs. That is great. And for those who are in the audience too, I mean, please feel free to reach out to BioStrategy Partners if you want to engage or get some more information on the, the programs that we have, both in the Philadelphia and the Central PA region. We can help you get connected with all of those resources. Um, so that actually brings us up to the top of the hour. I just want to say thank you so much to Christina and Julie for being here and sharing your wealth of expertise. It was so much appreciated. Absolutely. Christina, it was great to yeah. hear about your startup and what's going on. So fun that you're doing this yeah. um, boots on the ground. Thanks, Julie. It's good to work with you yet again.
And thanks yep, to uh, Michelle and Erica for having us. Yes, thank you, Michelle and Erica. Um, for everybody, you guys are in really great hands. Um, Michelle and Erica are tremendous people, so just engage with them and they'll guide you to the next place. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.